Okay, y'all, let's go ahead and get started on this exam three review. So the first question says, balance a whole number combustion reaction of benzene. Benzene is C6H6. Any kind of, kind of combustion reaction is always going to be something with carbon, hydrogen, and sometimes oxygen for the purposes of this class. So C6H6. What you're always going to react with in a combustion will always be O2, and you will always form CO2 and H2O. When we go to balance the reaction, we always want to do oxygen last because it's alone. And we talked about all combustion reactions, we like to chow it up. So on our left hand side, we have six carbons. On our right hand side, we only have one. We say six divided by one is six. So we put a six in front of there. Now we have six carbons. We move on to the hydrogen. On our left hand side, we have six. On our right hand side, we have two. Six divided by two is three. So we put a three in front of the water. So now we have three times this two would be six hydrogens. And last but not least, we do oxygen. Again, we do it last because it only affects one of the elements, and that's oxygen itself. So over here on our left, we have two. On our right, we have six times two, which is 12 from the CO2, plus three times one, which is three from the H2O. 12 plus three is 15. Now here's where a lot of people get stuck. They get scared, but 15 divided by two is just seven and a half, right? So you're just gonna write that, 7.5. That gives us 15 oxygens on both sides. But we don't usually like um, halvesies, and in fact, this says whole number. Seven and a half is not a whole number. So what we wanna do is multiply all these coefficients times two. What a lot of people miss is that this is a one. When there's nothing written, there's a one. So this coefficient is a one, this is a seven and a half, this is a six, and this is a three. And we're multiplying each of them by two. So what that, so two times the one would give us two C6H6, plus two times the 7.5 would give us 15 O2, yielding two times the six would give us 12 CO2, and two times the three would give us six H2O. And that would be our balanced whole number combustion reaction. Next it asks, what is the molar mass of benzene? Well, we know benzene is C6H6. It's got six carbons and six hydrogens in it. We know on the periodic table, if you were to look at it, hydrogen here would say 1.008. You wanna use three decimal places for hydrogen and carbon would be 12.01. Just two is fine for every other element but hydrogen. Hydrogen needs three decimal places. So again, that's just hydrogen. So we have six carbons. Carbon again is 12.01. So we do six times 12.01 plus six times 1.008. So my calculator, I'll put it in parentheses. I'll do six times 12.01 plus, new parentheses, six times 1.008. And I'll hit enter and it gives me 78.108 or 78.11 because our final answer would have ended up with two decimal places. What are the units of that? You should know those units. It's a gram per mole. It's the mass for a mole of this stuff. So if you had 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, it would have a mass of 78.11 grams. Keeping going, it says if you have 48.7 grams, how many mole do you have? Well, you know, again, if you had 78 grams, you'd have one mole. But it's saying, hey, now you have less than 78 grams. So we should expect less than a mole. Just to remind you guys how this goes, we are always going to go grams to mole to molecule to atom and we can go back to go from grams to moles we use the conversion of the molar mass which is in gram per mole so in this particular case it's 78.11 grams per mole is the molar mass to go from mole per molecule we use the fact that there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd 
molecule per mole. And to go from molecule to atom, we have to look at the individual thing and figure out the number of atoms per molecule. All right, these are just conversions. So we're doing like the shape game, if you guys remember the shape game. So it says you have 48.7 grams of benzene. How many mole do you have? Remember, when we're doing the shape game, we always start with a thing with one unit. Grams per mole has two, this has two, this has two. So we've got 48.7 grams is what we have to start with. If that's grams, we know we have to put grams down here. The, but to go from grams to mole, you need the molar mass. Again, that was 78.11 grams per mole. So if this is grams, we have to put the 78.11 grams here, and then mole is going up top. That got us from grams to mole. Now we're in moles, we need to get to molecules. If this is mole, we're just taking this mole right here and putting it up here. And then the molecule is going up top. That took us to molecule. I don't know why I'm doing all this. I need to stop because it asked for mole because it's late. It's been a very long day. I'm so sorry. I'm doing, I'm doing this next question here. That would take us to molecule. But we, know, we don't need to go all the way that far. And when, you, in fact, in class, you're going to do this probably the same thing. I see a lot of students do this. It says grams to mole. We only need it to go from here to here. So we just need one conversion. That was this one. And we should do it automatically. Anytime we have grams, you turn it into moles. So we got 48.7 divided by 78.11. And I get an answer of 0 0.62347 mole, but we only need two sig figs. 0 0.623 mole. And that should make sense again, because if we had 78 grams, we'd have a full mole. We don't even have 78, we only have 48.7 grams. All right, on to the next one. Now we can continue on. So it says you have this many grams. How many molecules do you have? Well, we got 48.7 grams. You know, the very first thing you do is put the molar mass down here and divide by molar mass. No matter what, anytime you have grams, you're going to do this step. But it happens to be that it asks us for a future step. It asks us to do it to molecules. So we know in a mole that there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So I'm going to take my 48.7 divided by 78.11 times 6.022 and then times 10 to the 23rd. And I get 3.75 times 10 to the 23rd. Which is less than a, a mole, which would have been 6.022. So it's looking good so far. Now we move on to the next question. It says, how many atoms are there? So last, we first went from grams to moles, then from grams to molecules. Now we're going from grams all the way to atom town. So we need to use all three of these conversions. Starting with our 48.7 grams. If this is grams, we have to put grams here and turn it into mole. That took us to moles. Now we gotta go from mole to molecule. We know in a mole, there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecule. Now we're in molecule town, we just need to get to atom town. It said specifically carbon atoms. I think even on the exam, when I ask a question like this, I bold it to make sure that you see it. Um, so don't accidentally pass over this. This is really important because when it, in a molecule, of C6H6, there are six carbon atoms. So it's really important that we know what it's talking about. If it did said total atoms, we would have put 12 total atoms, or hydrogen atoms, it would have been six hydrogen atoms. So now all we do is take our, our answer that we had before and multiply it by six. And I get 2.25 times 10 to the 24 carbon atoms, okay? The molecule should cancel, the moles should cancel, the grams should cancel. We're only left with atoms. All right, moving on. In the balanced combustion reaction of benzene, if you use up 4.3 mole of benzene, how many mole of carbon dioxide are made? Again, we know the balanced combustion reaction. We did it up here. 
but we know we react it with O2 to form CO2 and H2O. So we have our balanced reaction here. 2C6H6 plus 15O2, yielding 12CO2 and 6H2O. It says, if you use up 4.3 mole of benzene, boom, any numbers you see, write them there. Unless they're their, your actual yield, then, then we'll get there. So it said, you use up 4.3 mole of benzene, how many mole of carbon dioxide? That's my question mark. Right, normally, if there's two here, we find the limiting reactant first and then use that. But because there's only one here, we assume that there's plenty of oxygen. So all you do is start with what you're given. 4.3 mole of benzene. Now we're set because if that's mole benzene, we have to put mole here and move up to here. Anytime you have this number with the question mark, that's when you're going to use those coefficients. That's the stoichiometry we talked about. So if this is mole of benzene, I know for every two mole of benzene, using this coefficient here, I get 12 mole of CO2. So 4.3 times 12 divided by 2. 4.3 times 12 divided by 2 gives me 25.8 mole of CO2. Or my answer for this one would be just 26 mole of CO2 because this only had two sig figs here. This one's infinite, this is infinite. Coefficients are always infinite, but that one had two. All right, I'm gonna keep it going because time's minimum. Okay, aluminum oxide reacts with HCl to form aluminum chloride and water. Ooh, sounds like fun. It says balance this reaction. Okay, so um, the first thing we're gonna do is we need to know what aluminum oxide is. Remember, aluminum has a three plus charge, oxide has a two minus charge. Based on the periodic table, we should know this stuff. And if you don't, you need to go back to nomenclature because um, it's gonna really get you on the final exam. So we need two of those and three of those. That's aluminum oxide. It reacts with HCl to form aluminum chloride Again, Al3 plus and Cl minus would give us an AlCl3 and water. Okay, and now we need to balance this reaction. Kind of going left to right. I see there's one aluminum here and two there. So I'm probably going to have to put a two there. If I put a two there, that's going to give me six chlorines. So I should be thinking about that already, that chlorine is eventually going to be six. My hydrogen right here, I have one and a two there. So if I put a two there, that would only give me two chlorines. So I probably ought not to use the chlorine first to, to do it. And I, again, one hydrogen, two hydrogens, and I ought not use the hydrogen either. And then oxygen over here, I have three and one. So I'm eventually going to end up putting a three here, which would give me six hydrogens. So I'm gonna end up with six chlorines and six hydrogens. And I know that just from looking at it. So it depends wherever you want to start. Um, I'm going to start with the hydrogen because I like to get rid of like threes and stuff first. So, or, uh, excuse me, not the hydrogen, the oxygen because I like to get rid of threes. So let's go ahead and do that. Here we have one oxygen or three oxygen on this side and one on this side. So I'll start with the oxygen. There's nothing alone or paired with itself. So we knew we had to start with something. And it doesn't matter where we're going to end. So here I have three oxygens again. And over here, I have one. Three divided by one is three, so I put a three there. And that gives me the six hydrogens I knew I would get. That's why we're gonna move on to hydrogen next. On our left-hand side, we have one. On our right-hand side, now we have six. Six divided by one is six, so we're gonna put a six there. And that gave me the six chlorines, which I knew I was gonna get, right? That changed um, the number of chlorines, so now I look at chlorine. On my left-hand side, I have six. On my right-hand side, I only have three. So I need to put a two there in front of the aluminum to give me six, and now I'm all done. Now I have two aluminums on each side. So this is my balanced reaction. All right. Now it says if 14 grams of hydrochloric acid reacts with 12 grams of aluminum oxide, how many mole of water can be formed? Okay, the first thing you would do with grams is turn it into mole. 
before we even like have to read the problem. So let's do that real quick. It says for our HCl, we had 14 grams. I give you the molar mass. I always will unless I'm asking you to calculate it. So I'm dividing by 36.46 grams per mole. And this will tell me the mole of HCl. So 14 divided by 36.46 gives me, I'll write it down here, 0 0.38398. You always want to keep at least two sig figs, or more than you need. So this was two, so I really only needed just the three and the nine, which would have been a four and a zero. But it's okay to keep extra. You can always keep as many as you want, but it has to be at least two. Okay, and then I'm going to move on to the next one. 12 grams of aluminum oxide. So for my Al2O3, I have 12 grams. It tells me the molar mass of that is 101.96 grams per mole. So 12, oops, 12 divided by 101.96 gives me an answer of 0 0.1177. Again, we only need two sig figs, so we need two extras so for a total of four. Okay, so those are my number of mole. I know my mole of HCl, I know my mole of aluminum oxide, and now I can go back to this. So it tells us, essentially we're using this reaction up here. We know that we have Al2O3 plus six HCl yielding two AlCl3 and three waters. We only ever put moles underneath here. So the first mole for HCl is 0 0.38398, and that had two sig figs. The mole for aluminum oxide is 0 0.1177. Seven, and that had two sig figs. And the question is how many mole of water can be formed? We have two things and a question mark. What is your first step? Your first step is finding the limiting reaction, or the limiting reactant. So that's only, your only option are the two reactants, this and this. So you divide the numbers by your coefficients and ask which one is smaller. If I take this and divide it by one, and I take this and divide it by six, this one is going to be much smaller than this one. Okay, so this is my limiting reactant. HCl is my LR. Once I know that, I don't need this information anymore. All that tells us is what's going here. The limiting reactant's going up here. Do you remember on this previous page that we did? We didn't have a limiting reactant. We only had one thing, so that was the thing that went here. All limiting reactant does is it tells you which thing's going here. That's going to be our 0.38398 mole of HCl. So I'm doing a very bad job keeping this clean, but this should have been mole of HCl. If this is mole of HCl, I have to put mole HCl down here. There are six mole of HCl, and then I put what I'm turning it into for every three mole of water. Okay. So you can move up and you can use your answer that you had before, like with all the numbers, totally reasonable. Just keep track of the fact that it should have had two sig figs. So I'm gonna do this times three divided by six, and it gives me an answer of 0 0.19199. Again, it should have two sig figs, so my answer should be 0 0.19 mole of H2O. That's my theoretical yield, also known as our theoretical yield. Cool. Now we're on to this. If 1.9 grams of water is formed in the reaction above, what is the percent yield? So now we have to figure out the percent yield. Percent yield, if you remember, equals actual yield divided by theoretical yield times 100%. Good news, we already got the theoretical yield. It's right here. Now we just need our actual yield. Well, we should have already, when we're reading this question, see grams <clears throat> and think, boom, 
I gotta turn that dude into water or into moles. <laughs> turn it into water. Turn it into moles. Goodness. So I do that by saying there's 1.9 grams and then divide by the molar mass. The molar mass was given up here. There's 18.02 grams in a mole. 1.9 divided by 1.9 divided by 18.02 gives me an answer of 0 0.1054 and it would have two sig figs mole of water. That's how many mole of water were formed. What does that make that? If it's formed, remember we talked, formed, created, produced, yielded, um, precipitated, all those words that are in the past mean that this was our actual yield, okay? We already know our percent yield equals actual yield over theoretical yield times 100%. We know the theoretical was 0 0.19 with two sig figs, 199. We'll keep those extras because you don't want to round in the middle of the problem. And that was mole of water. You also now know the actual yield is 0 0.19. 1054 with two sig figs, mole of water. You have to make sure mole of water and mole of water match. We can't be like, this is a dinner roll and this is the fries. Like that doesn't work. So you have to keep, make sure it's fries here and fries there, or mole of water and mole of water, and then times 100. When we say times 100, we mean times 100 with a unit of percent. So let's go ahead and do it. Okay. So I'm gonna do, actually I'll do the second answer. And I'll divide that by 0 0.19199, and then times 100. I get 54.9%. This had two sig figs, this had two sig figs. This means I'm talking about 55% overall. But remember, most of these are multiple choice. Okay, moving on. For the following reaction, which elements are oxidized and which are reduced? So remember, that's when we have to label the oxidation number of each thing, which is pretty much like it's charged when it's in an ionic compound. We also had the rules of hydrogen is plus one, and oxygen is minus two, when they're in um, covalent compounds. The most important thing, though, is if it's alone, it gets a zero. That was super important. So going kind of left to right, I'm like, whoo, I see nickel. And we went, whoo, whoo. And we gave that a zero. And then we saw hydrogen. It's all alone. It's paired with itself, yes, but it's alone. It's only one thing. That's alone. We went, whoo, whoo, yeehaw. And now we can look at the rest. Remember, you only write the oxidation number for one of those species. So like I look at this hydrogen here. I know that that's a positive one because hydrogen's always plus one, but it's also in the first column. Chlorine is a minus one, because it's in the seventh column. Then I get over here, I know chlorine is a minus one. Even though there are two chlorines, you only put for one species. Otherwise, it'll look like it changed. Chlorine didn't change. It was a negative one here. It was a negative one there. Chlorine didn't change. However, we can use that to figure out nickel. If we have NiCl2, and we know that we had two negative ones, in other words, a two minus coming from here, that means this thing had to be in two plus, and that's why nickel is a two plus. All right, let's see what happened to each of these things. Nickel went from a zero up, and chlorine again stayed the same, and hydrogen went from a positive one to a zero. Hydrogen went from positive one to zero, that was reduced. So when we say what was reduced, Hydrogen was reduced. It went from positive 1 to 0. And when we say what was oxidized, nickel went from 0 up. So nickel was oxidized. Now it says what type of reaction is this? Well, we had one thing here, another compound here, and that chlorine moved from here over to here. Do you remember we talked about something like this? And we're like, hey, if we have some kind of X plus Y, Z, and it forms some kind of X, Z plus Y, we call that a single displacement. Okay. And that's what this is. It's a single displacement reaction. 
keep it going. Okay, convert 48.7 kilojoules to kilocalorie. I asked you to memorize one thing, and it was this, that there are 4.184 joules in a calorie. The beautiful thing about this is if you multiply this and you multiply this by 1,000, that's also the same thing as saying there's 4.184 kilojoules per kilocal. Same exact thing. You just multiplied both of them by 1,000, so it works. The ratio remains the same. So it says convert 48.7 kilojoules into kilocal. All you got to do is use this conversion, that there are 4.184 kilojoules in a kilocal. 48.7 divided by 4.184. And I get 11.6 kilocal. Cool, right? All right. It says draw an energy diagram for the combustion of benzene. Label all the important parts. It says from part one, so, or from number one. So if you remember, benzene was this reaction. We don't know anything about the delta H of this reaction, but we do know something. It was combustion reaction. And we did talk about combustion reactions in class. We said when you combust something, that's like burning it. If you light something on fire, it's burning, right? You wouldn't like go touch it. The reason you wouldn't go touch it is because it's letting out heat and it would burn you. So this thing lets out heat. Anytime you have a combustion reaction, that means it must be exothermic. It must be letting out heat. Okay, so if it's exothermic, it's letting out heat when we go to do our energy diagram. We know that we're going to start at a certain energy level for the products or for the reactants, and then the products must end up at a lower energy level. That's exothermic. If it was endo, it would have been higher. Also for exothermic, that means your delta H must be negative, just to, to remind you all this stuff. But these are not the important parts yet. It says label all the important parts we talked about in class. That would be the reaction coordinate as the x-axis label. That would be energy, or E, as the y-axis label. We talked about labeling the activation energy, E sub A, that's the amount of energy it takes for the reaction to occur. And we talked about labeling the transition state. That's it, those are the only parts that we really, really talked about in class that I said you had to know. Okay, if the delta H of the whole number of combustion of benzene is negative 6524, how much heat would be released when 48.7 grams of benzene combust? 48.7 grams, what do you do with grams? Turn it into mole. Don't worry about the problem yet. We take 48.7 grams, we turn that sucker into mole. We already know the mass of benzene. And if you forgot it or you start worrying about that, make sure you remember that in my exam, I do the same thing. I put pieces together and ask you random questions to kind of help guide you through. So benzene was 78.11 grams per mole. We calculated it number one. All right, so we calculate, so let's go ahead and calculate that. 48.7 divided by 78.11. And I get an answer of 0 0.62347. So this is three sig figs, so yeah, so we'll do four, eight. It's kind of fun because we're using just all the same numbers we've already used. Okay, so that's how many mole of C6H6 there. Now it says, if the delta H of the whole number combustion reaction of benzene is this, how much heat would be released when that many mole of benzene combusts? Okay, so if we write this reaction out again, from, from where we were, it's 2C6H6 plus 15O2. Boy, I sure hope I balanced this right. 
yielding 12 CO2 and 6 H2O. All right. So the first thing you do is take your moles from the problem and put them under the thing. Okay, so we've talked about benzene, so that's where we're putting our mole. It also gave us some information that we're not usually used to having because we only did it one day in class, but this is the delta H. It says the delta H equals negative 6524 KJs. Okay. So it says, if the whole number combustion reaction is this, how much heat would be released when this much combusts? So that's the moles that we put there. The question is how much heat, meaning it didn't ask about CO2 or O2 or water. We would have put the question mark there. It asked about how much heat. So when we go to do our thing, we only have one thing that we can put there. That's the mole, 0 0.62348 mole of C6H6. That's the only thing we could put there. And anytime you have a number and a question mark, that's when you're going to do the stoichiometry, the, the coefficients here. This is 2 mole of C6H6. But the difference is there's no coefficient here. It's just heat. But I hope you agree. For every 2 mole of this, I react it with 15 mole of this. I get 12 mole of that, 6 mole of that, and that much heat. So if I react 2 mole of C6H6, I get that much heat negative six five two four kilojoules and that's kind of how you relate it for every two mole you get that much heat so i'm going to take my number that i had divide it by two times six five two four and i get negative two zero three eight kilojoules this has infinite this has four this had three, so our number should have three. That's negative two, zero, four, zero kilojoules if you want to do great sig figs. Okay. And hopefully that makes some sense because if we had two mole, we would have gotten 6,500, but we don't have two mole. We only have 0.6, so we should expect a decent amount smaller than 6,500. Moving on, Woohoo, last page. Consider the following reaction, okay? It says write an equilibrium expression. So the first thing we do is that the equilibrium expression K, we know K equals the products over the reactants raised to their powers. So the, the product is SO3, and it would be raised to the power of two. Here we have SO2. raised to its power of two, and we have an O2. So that's the equilibrium expression. Now it says, using these concentrations, find K. What is K actually equal to? So here we're going to plug in the 1.8 for the SO3. The SO2 is going to be 3.1. And the O2 is going to be 1.6. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug those in. K equals 1.8. Don't forget to square it. It's so easy to forget that stuff. That's why it's important to write the expression first. Here we have a 3.1 that's squared times a 1.6. There are many ways to do this. Um, you know, you can use the little hat if you have the hat to do the square. Or if you want to do it really fast, if you do 1.8, times 1.8, here you've got two 3.1s, they're both on the bottom, so divide it by 3.1, divide it by 3.1, and then you have a 1.6, divided by 1.6. 1 1.8 times 1.8, divided by 3.1, divided by 3.1, divided by 1.6, gives me an answer of 0 0.21. That's my K. So it asks, what's, what's more favorite, products or reactants? Remember, if we have a K greater than one, it favors products. If we have a K less than one, it favors reactants. I think you'll agree, 0.21 is less than one, which means there's more reactants. The bottom number is gonna be bigger. 
that's the only way you're going to get something less than one. And that means the reactants are favored. Because 0.21 is less than one. All right? Now it says if you add more SO3, which direction will the reaction go? Remember we talked about like a, like a seesaw. But we said the important thing is when you add stuff, you don't picture like piling stuff on top, pushing it down. You picture lifting it up. So if we add more SO3, we're lifting up the SO3 side. If we lift up the SO3 side, it's going to go this direction, right? It's going to go fall down this way. So if we add more SO3, push this thing up, all the other things fall this way to the left. So it said toward the product or toward the reactants, it will go toward the reactant side, toward the left. Last but not least, it says, if, if the pressure increases, which direction will it move? So remember, when we talk about pressure, if you increase the pressure, it always moves. It pushes, smushes all the gases together, moves to fewer gas moles. Okay? So if you increase the pressure, it's going to move to the side with fewer gas moles because it pushes and smushes things together. So here we have two moles of SO2 plus one mole of this. So we have a total of three moles of gas on this side, and we only have a total of two moles of gas on this side. So if we start smooshing them together, the three mole side would take up too much space. So the two mole sm side would be smaller. So we are actually gonna go this way to the two mole side, increase pressure, move to fewer gas moles. So if we increase the pressure, we're going to make more products. So it's going to go toward the products. Always decide toward the fewer moles. Is that everything? I think that's everything. Woohoo! We did it. Go crew. All right. Have a great night, you guys, or a great day, great whatever time it is when you're watching this. And you're going to kick some booty, and I will see you in class. Bye, y'all.